Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Kennan Institute. My name is Will Pomerantz. I'm Deputy Director, and we are pleased to have you today with, uh, for today's virtual event on the Gulag and historical memory in Russia's far north. Before I begin, I would like to extend a specific thanks to the State Department's Title A program. Uh, the Kennan Institute has been a part of the Title, uh, Title A program for 35 years now, and it is thanks to its generous support that we are able to help scholars uh, who are focused on Russia and Eurasia every year. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the Historical and Human Rights Society Memorial provided an outlet to document and publicize abuses of the totalitarian system. In the Komi region, uh, Komi Republic, a region in Russia's far north that was home to one of the densest networks of Soviet labor camps, the local memorial society, received a flood of correspondence, which began during Glasnost and continued following the Soviet Union's collapse. This posed a intense dilemma that revealed both the legacy of the Gulag and the local politics of memory during a revolutionary moment and in Soviet and post-Soviet history. And we are pleased today to have uh, Tyler Kirk to discuss these developments. He is an assistant professor of history and the Assistant Director of Arctic and Northern Studies at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. From 2016 to 2017, he was a Fulbright Scholar in Russia, where he conducted research for his doctoral dissertation and current book manuscript, Remembering the Gulag, Coming to Terms with the Past in Russia's Far North, 1987-1920, uh, to 2020, sorry about that. Uh, he is currently completing a Title VIII Research Scholarship at the Kennan Institute. And a reminder, if you have a question, uh, you can submit them via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending these questions. And Tyler, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Will, for that lovely introduction. And I'm thrilled uh, to be here today with you um, and everyone else that's tuning in. Um, so as Will said, this is a, a uh, presentation of my research so far um, uh, and my uh, current book project um, entitled Remembering the Gulag, A History of Coming to Terms of the Past in Russia's Far North, 1987 to 2020. Um, and so to get us started, um, I want to um, emphasize that um, the history of Stalinist repression um, has been taken many different approaches, uh, but it's been primarily dominated by the state. Um, and my research is not uh, history of the Gulag per se, rather it aims to make the colossal nature of Stalinist repression um, accessible by grounding it um, in the complexities of individuals who experienced it um, and then testified um, at the end of the Soviet regime. And so um, due the more, to the more recent nature of this history, uh, the story that my project tells uh, sheds new light on both earlier periods of Soviet history, sort of life after release for Gulag returnees, um, um, life of life of the Soviet in the Soviet Union through the eyes of those whom the state repressed and then ultimately attempted to rehabilitate um, in its waning years. And so my talk today is divided into two parts. Uh, part one will provide a brief overview of my arguments and the sources and the contributions I make to Soviet history and memory studies. Um, and part two of my talk will explore the ways in which uh, Gulag returnees transformed the northern landscape um, where they once lived as prisoners um, and uh, the cities they built as prisoners uh, from monuments to socialist labor um, and the con Soviet conquest of the North to into monuments to their achievements and suffering. And so I'd like to begin um, on the current slide um, with a source that illustrates one of the major um, issues that my research addresses. Um, and this is a monument that the Soviet Union's, Soviet Union's very first monument to the victims of political repression um, which was erected on November 26, 1956. And this picture was appended to a KGB report that I found in the National Archive of the Komi Republic when I was conducting research in Siktivkar, Russia. Um, and um, it contains uh, a description uh, of the event that transpired and how the, a, an explanation for how this monument came into being. Um, this, and this was decades before um, the Solovetsky stone was placed on Lubyanka Square outside the KGB building. Um, so this monument um, 
preceded the, the, so the Memorial's first monument to victims of political repression. And the report, which I'll share a, bit, a excerpt with you, um, reads in part, quote, on July 29th in the second district of the city of Inta, the unveiling of a monument to Latvians who died in the camp and exile took place at the entrance to the cemetery. The unveiling was attended by a large crowd of approximately 200 people with the accompaniment of a brass band. A number of speeches were given during the unveiling of the monument, several of which bore a nationalist character. As one speaker, a Latvian named Krestinch said, quote, we unveil this monument to the departed daughters and sons, victims of arbitrariness, who will never see the motherland again. The memory of them will live forever in our hearts, end quote. After unveiling the monument, uh, those, those present performed the bourgeois Latvian anthem, God Save Latvia, end of report. And so this fascinating document, and you can see in the photograph um, uh, that the mo monument, the Z which reads Zimtene in Latvian means to the motherland, um, is at the site of this former camp prison um, cemetery. You can see a camp building, administrative building in the background. Um, you can see the flowers, the wreath of flowers that were laid um, at the feet of this monument. Um, and so rather than destroy it, to pre for, but to prevent further displays of this type, KGB officers conducted several prophylactic meetings with prisoners and exiles in town. However, they ultimately left the monument in place and aband simply abandoned it in 1962 when the cemetery was closed. However, the monument did not pass on into oblivion. Um, 33 years after um, it was first erected, the monument made headlines in Comey um, when it became a symbol of the local effort to contribute to the national project of coming to terms with the Stalinist past. And on August 23rd or 22nd, 1989, um, a regional Comey newspaper reported that the monument had been restored and the cemetery reopened um, in a ceremony that commemorated the victims of Stalinist repression, um, which was attended by local residents, members of the newly formed um, Historical Enlightenment Memorial Society, um, and former prisoners who unveiled the monument, uh, first unveiled the monument in 1956. And while the article acknowledged uh, the efforts of this diverse group of concerned citizens, it underscored the group's Latvian um, majority. And so in a subsequent interview published just days later, uh, a 77-year-old Gulag returnee who traveled all the way from Latvia to attend the ceremony, um, set the record straight. Um, he uh, emphasized that the monument was, quote, not only a tribute to the memory of Latvian victims of Stalin's repressions, but also a warning to all future peoples, Russians, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Germans, Jews, the fates of the prisoners of the Gulag archipelago must never be repeated, end quote. And so ultimately, I start with this uh, monument from 1956 and a project about the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, because the story of the Zimtene monument illuminates two of the central questions of the late 1980s and early 1990s. And those are, who were the victims of political repression and how should they be remembered? It also reveals the essential role that former prisoners played in recovering the past. And lastly, this monument raises questions about why so many survivors came forward after decades of silence. Um, and so my research ultimately explores how ordinary political prisoners, and I call them ordinary um, political prisoners because they were not um, dissidents, nor were the majority of them um, part of the intelligentsia, um, nor were many of them members of the party. Um, I explore how these people asserted their agency as mnemonic actors in translating their experiences on both sides of the barbed wire into memoirs, letters, and art. And so ultimately, um, these narratives, these autobiographical narratives, um, as I argue, informed the cultural memory of the Gulag and the Komi Republic, um, which crystallized in texts, ceremonies, monuments, and civil associations, i.e. memorial. Um, and so as those who bore the brunt of Stalinist violence and survived, these former prisoners' life stories served as the basis of an alternate version of Soviet history. And this is also what made them so powerful, um, that they were based upon the details of individual lives of thousands of ordinary Soviet people. Um, and previously, however, um, only artistic representations of the camps were presented in the works of the members of the repressed Soviet intelligentsia, 
um, during Khrushchev's thaw of the 1950s and 1960s, um, when we have the publication, of, for instance, of so Alexander Solzhenitsyn's famous novella, um, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Um, however, um, this was um, the story was also shaped not just by what former prisoners remembered and the stories they told about themselves and among the community, but also by an ongoing dialogue between survivors and civic organizations such as the Memorial Society. So this was part of a, a conversation, a private conversation and a public conversation that happened um, at the level of the region um, with, between former prisoners and the Memorial Society and also the national conversation um, that unfolded in the pages of the national press and the regional press. And I have a chapter on that um, in my book project on the, on the regional coverage of this, um, th these discoveries. But ultimately, um, this new narrative was brought to the public and mobilized by the formation of and the spread of the Memorial Society to the Komi Republic, um, and, which coalesced um, into a civil part, what became part of the civil society, nascent civil society that emerged um, after the collapse, only after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that these, this organization was formed by a coalition of those who had not been repressed, um, victims or survivors of political repression, as they would refer to themselves, um, and their families. And so this memory project may have been initiated from the top, but it was very much driven from below, as it was in Western memory project of coming in terms of the totalitarian Nazi government was in, um, in Western Europe. And so Another key point that I want to emphasize here before we jump in um, to part two of the presentation is that this success of Memorial in Comey, which has um, undergone some changes as we'll discuss um, today, um, the success of this movement was based to a large extent upon the social networks that prisoners formed in the camps that enabled them to survive, um, the friendships that they made, and these friendship networks. And so, um, as, a, as these informal mutual aid societies um, that enabled the most vulnerable members of Soviet society to protect one another, or at least try to, um, from the state, um, they provided gulag returnees with a community of their own after release and a much more needed sense of moral support um, as they reintegrated back into a society that remained largely hostile to them. Um, and they refer to this in their memoirs as, as being members of the Camp Brotherhood, um, members of a, of a community of outfits or comrades and unhappiness. There's many different for, words for it, but essentially they refer to it as a camp, being a part of the camp brotherhood. And while this, um, these networks enabled them to survive after release, they also laid the foundations for what became a community of memory. Um, and former prisoners used these friendships and these social networks to spread the story of um, their story, but also to connect with others in, in order to get them um, and their testimonies to um, Memorial Society, the Memorial Society in Comey. And there were several branches um, of the Memorial Society uh, that emerged in the Comey Republic and existed for various uh, periods of time. Um, and these were usually tied to, um, or, or part of, or eventually became part of the local history museums um, that existed throughout the region. Um, and so uh, these, former prisoners relied upon these networks, not only to survive, but also to engage in this memory project. And so one of the questions, big questions that uh, you may have are, you know, why take a regional approach to such a massive national problem? Approximately 18 million people go through uh, the camps from their, from their foundation in 1929 to the time about when most of them were shuttered in 1960, though the camps continue to exist and albeit radically altered form under Khrushchev and um, um, Brezhnev and Gorbachev. Um, but why focus on Comey when the Gulag linked the entire Soviet Union and political repression affected all strata of society? And so in answering that question, I, I show you this map of the Comey Republic to just to show, to reinforce how densely populated, colonized Comey was, the far north was, by institutions and people linked to um, political repression. And so um, Comey is emblematic of the colonization of the far north, the high north that um, happened um, in the 1930s and 1940s, but also um, um, Comey is unique for the density 
of, of its prisoner population, former prisoner population, which um, was more densely populated um, than most other regions of the Soviet Union. Um, however, it did undergo um, transformation as other regions did. And so um, I also want to underscore that um, Memorial was successful, going back to this previous slide, Memorial was successful in, in large part because it ha had bases of support. Vorkuta, um, Inta, Pichora, Uhta, um, all were towns, Pichora, um, all were towns that had basically been built by prisoners and each town had a Memorial Society. Now Siktivkar was linked to this um, carceral network, although there were no camps in the city itself um, in the capital of the Komi Republic. Um, and so I explore, use the region as a, as a level of exploration in order to better understand um, the links between people and environment and, and memory um, in, the, in the lived in, to explore space. Um, so the archives that my project are based upon are diverse. Um, I draw from our dispersed and diverse uh, questionnaires, memoirs, letters, newspapers, and personal archives and monuments. Um, former prisoners did not uh, donate these uh, sources, these materials to um, state and party archives, the heirs of the system that they were testifying against, they sent them to branches of local branches of the Memorial Society, regardless of whether they lived in Comey or if they had already left. And that's um, absolutely fascinating to me. And a really important part, I think, of my research is that it shows that these people didn't necessarily, although some of them sent materials to Moscow, they wanted their stories to belong in the region where they had once been imprisoned. And so I also came to study these, to use these sources and found these sources out of a frustration with the restrictions I encountered in 2016, 2017, when I was in uh, working in state archives in Russia, um, when it was difficult to access um, prisoner files or, or many files were redacted to protect privacy laws. But since former prisoners donated these um, materials themselves to museums, they wanted them to be used. I, I found that to be absolutely fascinating part and, and, and uh, representative of them asserting their agency as um, memory actors in this memory project. And so Siktiv Kar Memorial um, began as, as part of a network of former prisoners. Um, uh, Revolt Ivanovich Pimonov was a dissident um, and a pr prisoner of the Khrushchev era, but he was the founder of Siktiv Kar Memorial. People rallied around him. Um, he became Comey's first um, representative to the Congress of People's Deputies. Um, and basically he says in this letter to a colleague, he's very skeptical that um, Memorial will have any traction. Um, and he underscores that the society was built upon the network of former prisoners and exiles of which he was a part of that community, but also um, Soviet youth, so Komsomols, um, um, people who would have not been repressed necessarily. Um, and then he also goes on in this letter to say um, that very few, wrong, wrongly as, as it turned out, that very few people were interested and even, even fewer participated um, because they were afraid and the only thing that enticed them um, was the hope of material aid from Memorial. However, between 1989 and 1997, Siktivkar Memorial received thousands of letters and petitions for rehabilitation. Um, after Pimenov dies in 1990, um, this man, Mikhail Borisovich Rogachev, takes over uh, more or less. He becomes active in Memorial. He was a history, he's a historian and he was a history teacher in Siktivkar. Um, and he began the um, public office hours in the, out of the city administration building where former prisoners who lived in Komi could come and get help um, registering for rehabilitation and navigating the bureaucracy to obtain rehabilitation. They also collected oral histories, um, they collected letters and used this as a point of contact with former prisoners. Um, and, and over the course of um, their existence, the time that they held these office hours, they registered thousands of former prisoners or victims of political repression, exiles, former prisoners, and their children, um, all um, as victims of political repression. And so, um, I'm going, speeding up because I'm running out of time, but after decades of silence, why uh, did survivors write about their past? Um, they wanted to be heard. Uh, they wanted to share their lives as evidence of past crimes. Um, they wanted to ensure that the story of Stalinist repression 
um, was not only told from the perspective of the intelligentsia, they wanted to speak for the dead, their dead comrades, um, and they also wanted to assert their agency as survivors and not just be known as, as victims. Um, and they wanted to participate in the memory project of coming to terms with the Stalinist past. Um, and um, as one uh, former prisoner wrote from Kiev to uh, Mikhail Borisovich, um, he writes, quote, the only thing that I wish is that this cruel, terrible epic not pass away in memory. It should enter into history so that it never happens again, end quote. So there are hundreds of letters like this from ordinary people who had never before told anyone about their past, never come forward before, and they did so um, during this historic moment when Gorbachev sort of opened the jar, uh, ultimately, fatefully for the last time. As part of this dialogue, um, Gulag returnees helped Memorial map the landscape. Um, there had been rumors about camps and rumors about where they existed and didn't exist. Um, and, but more so, they helped former, for the former prisoners helped Memorial locate the, the location, pinpoint the location of mass graves where prisoners were buried. Um, and so as one former prisoner writes in uh, to Mikhail Borisovich from Chuvashia, in January 1989, quote, we were released in 1947. And since then, more than 50 years have passed, but we still know where the graves of those who were executed are. We can show you the place and help dig them up. There are about 1,500 people there. And so I want to do a side-by-side -side comparison here. Um, here we have the map of the Gulag and Komi. You can see the black line is the railroad, the Vorkuta Moscow Railroad um, that goes north. Brought Vork it brought coal from Vorkuta to central Russia. Um, but also on the right hand, on my right hand side of the screen, you see a map with just um, or, uh, green circles with blue dots. These are all mass graves and monuments, um, mass graves that were discovered throughout Komi and monuments um, that were placed, memorials that were placed um, at these sites of memory. And so they largely follow the railroad and the, the locations of the camps as Memorial discovered them thanks to the efforts of former, former prisoners. <laughs> Um, and so the monuments, I will just say this, kind of wrapping things up in the next five minutes, monuments took many forms. They took forms, uh, they held requiem services and took the forms of, of sort of more traditional religious symbols. Um, they also held weeks of conscience when they read poems um, and read names of those who had been repressed. Um, this was at a mass grave that was discovered just outside of Uhta, which was a um, oil and gas mining town um, that was built upon a gulag. Um, another um, important site of memory in the Arctic is Borkuta, which was a coal mine um, developed in coal company town uh, um, that was developed um, by forced labor. Um, and we have just a foundation stone on top of a, 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 a blanking on the word, fundament um, and with the Borkuta coal mine in one of the mines in the background. Um, and these sites, these texts, um, all designate the landscape in the cities that former prisoners built themselves as monuments to their suffering and their labor. So while we don't always have monuments in particular sites, former prisoners wrote about the landscape that they helped to transform from empty tundra and taiga into these Soviet socialist cities um, as their monuments um, to their, both their achievement as they were proud of them, but also their suffering. Um, and we have various different kinds of monuments here, um, also marking grave sites, um, also a sculpture that a former prisoner had made, the sculpture of Pushkin, which is in downtown Uhta. Um, and so monuments take many different forms. The, the infrastructure of cultural memory in Komi is very diverse. Um, the um, chapel that is depicted here on your screen is a mosaic on the outside. It looks like a place to pray for the dead. It is a um, memorial symbolic graveyard. Um, the, the plinth here, um, the granite tomb contains soil from each major camp complex. The mosaic contains imagery depicting the story of political repression with the names of the camps and an inner sa um, um, sanctuary to pray for the dead and the flowers were laid there on the day of memory of political repression on October 30th, um, 2016. And so it's a, it's a site of memory and it's a site of mourning, um, but it's uh, representative of the attempt to find a mutual language of, of 
uh, both that pleases the state and the church, but also that is something that was supported by former prisoners in their um, in their search for a way to commemorate their their past and their suffering. And so um, I have I have a, a lot more to say, but I'll leave it there for now and let more come out uh, in Will's comments and the questions. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Tyler. And a reminder, if you have a question, uh, you can submit them by email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Thanks so much, Tyler, for that fascinating uh, presentation. Um, there are many questions that it, uh, it, it, it raises, but I, I'm very interested in this question about the informal networks that continue to exist during the Soviet period, um, this Camp Brotherhood and the help that was rendered to former prisoners evidently throughout the Soviet Union. And my question is, uh, since the Soviet Union didn't really respect informal organizations, uh, to what extent was this group monitored and did the state try to interfere with its actions? That's an excellent question. Um, and. Uh, other historians, uh, for instance, Alan Barenberg, have done an excellent job um, in their work um, looking at how the ways in which the KGB and, and police networks kept tabs on former prisoners that were necessarily troublemakers. Um, however, uh, in the sources that I've found, um, they, they support this, but I also think that many of them lived quite quietly. Um, and so they did not necessarily, um, they always risked kind of interference if it became more than just helping one another out. Um, but it, they were so dispersed. And so um, these were networks of friends who got together and helped one another out, um, or maybe who helped out acquaintances. And so they don't necessarily in the, in write about um, being interfered with, though that was certainly always, um, always a risk that they ran um, in gathering together um, because frankly, I mean, even if even after um, the thaw in the 50s and 60s, they these were still marked people. Um, there was still a stigma attached to them. Okay, I have uh, two questions here uh, from Michael Daniel Sagatis. Uh, his first question is: How historically accurate is Moscow's Museum of Gulag history in admitting the full extent of Soviet oppressive acts? And his second question. Are official landmarks of state history Russia's attempt at historical reckoning, or are they an example of Russia's soft power and just a gesture for Muscovites and tourists to view? Um, I'll st those, those are two excellent questions. Uh, I think that with regards to the museum, um, uh, Kathleen Smith has an excellent article out about it right now, and I know that um, Jeff Hardy, another historian, is writing about it. Um, I, I personally feel that like any museum, like any narrative, there are silences in it, right? Um, there are holes in the narrative. Um, and so there, there, are, there are things that are left out um, from the museum's narrative, um, but it's, it's difficult to encapsulate um, the complexity of the gulag um, in a museum exhibit. Um, and even, even like people in, Com in the Comey Republic who, um, create exhibits with the best of intentions that there are things that they just simply leave out. And so I think that the museum does a good job and it's important that the museum exists in Moscow, um, that the museum does a good job of, of, of sort of putting this narrative out there, um, even if it does have some, some um, silences and issues with it. Um, the question about the state narrative, I mean, there's a, so there's a great, there's a conflict between the drive towards patriotism um, in contemporary Russia and the state's attempt to make good on its, you know, its discourse of, uh, and its laws actually of um, supporting memory of political repression, commemorating victims of political repression. Uh, I mean, the state and the church have tried to co-opt this role from Memorial, um, which has always been a leader um, in commemorating the victims of political repression. And so, yeah, it is, it is kind of a form of the state flexing its uh, soft power. Um, however, I think in my region, that's one of the things that I found is that 
the state can exert pressure on these groups. Um, and Memorial eventually, and I didn't get to say this in the presentation, Memorial became um, the Repentance Foundation, Fond Pacayanya, um, and they joined with the state um, in that they receive money from the state budget, but zero um, from the local Republican budget, local government budget, um, to publish their books of memory, but they really haven't been um, told what they can and cannot print. Um, so there's different levels of it in the regions. It's a little bit different, um, but in, in certainly in Moscow, um, there's sort of this, as has been well written and documented about this flex of soft power and hard power too. I mean, denying historians access to archival, to archives um, in Comey and in Russia is, is definitely, um, definitely a form of, of state interference in the state trying to manipulate the, the historical memory of political repression in Russia. Thanks very much. And uh, we still we have a lot more questions coming in, so please keep sending them. Uh, the first question comes from Twit via Twitter. Uh, how unique is a place like Comey in retaining a robust culture of historical memory? What about it would you say lends to that culture? Um, I think Comey is pretty, I think Comey is like other regions that also experienced a, um, a sort of blossoming, a boom, a memory boom um, in the 80s and 90s. However, Comey is unique in my eyes in that it sustained this memory boom um, long after sort of the, the, the craze of truth telling and um, talking about the darker chapters of the past faded into the background. Um, elsewhere in, in Russia. And um, I think what makes Comey unique is that they had such local branches of Memorial and fun, eventually Fund Pakayanya had um, such overwhelming support from the former prisoners and their children. A lot of people remained in Comey after they were released. Um, they simply either didn't have anywhere else to go um, or um, didn't um, or, or didn't have the option to go anywhere else. And so this continued support from children of former prisoners and families was a big part of that. Um, I also um, think that Comey, I mean, Fun Pakayanya is unique in that it, it is an actively supported organization. Um, they face the same struggles to gain access to archives, um, which are controlled by the federal government in Moscow, um, but they are, virtually unhindered in their ability to um, make museum exhibits and continue to do conduct field work and research. Um, they continue to ex excavate and consult on mass graves that when they're um, discovered. I mean, they were just recently, when I was living there in um, April, 2017, found another um, mass grave, the unknown mass grave that was attached to a former camp. And so there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think that's this memory and this legacy is a fundamental part now of um, Comey's history. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why it's still so robust. Thanks so much, Tyler. Again, if you have questions, send them via email, uh, Kenan at Wilson Center, Twitter, Kenan Institute at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page. But we do have several questions uh, still to be answered. So from Dan Jordan, uh, he asks, he's, uh, he mentions that Dr. Kirk says that returnees and relatives of prisoners wanted to have their stories told not only by the intelligentsia. What do they, did they feel would be lost if the stories were told only by the intelligentsia or were not told by locals and people with a deeper connection to those prisoners? Yeah, uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I feel that the sources say, um, that the former prisoner said in their own words that they didn't just want the intelli intelligentsia to speak for them um, because they had previously spoken for them. I mean, a lot of them criticized um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's work, um, refer to one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, which all of them had read, um, and also um, parts of the Gulag Archipelago when it came out in the 90s and, and criticized some of the, the details that they knew because they had um, experienced them and they had only gotten to social needs in second hand. Um, and so they were writing in to correct um, intellectuals um, 
um, mistakes in, in telling the story, but also to ensure that these just ordinary, per, ordinary, the perspectives of ordinary people were represented in this local history. Um, and that's one of the um, Russian Kravidinya, local history is, is very much about featuring local stories about local regions and, and local people. And so they were very much engaged in this project of Kravidinya, local history. Um, Okay, our next question is from former Ambassador Deborah McCarthy. Uh, what groups currently visit Gulag sites? I understand there is a yearly visit of Lithuanians to include children that include children. Yeah, um, former children um, definitely go to these sites. Lithuanians, Latvians still go. Um, they were going to Komi. I don't know if they have um, in recent times, um, but I do know uh, there was a monument uh, that I didn't get to show on my screen and I could maybe show it really quickly to answer your question um, but let's just show you so this monument right here this is the water tower in Inta I don't know if you're listening or, or looking at the screen but there's a water tower in Inta that was built by designed by a repressed Swedish architect and built by prisoners it served Inta Lag, Min Lag, um, coal mining city in the subarctic um, where the Latvian and Lithuanian monuments are um, and they turned it in 2012, I think, if I remember correctly, into museum. And it gets about 10,000 visitors a year. And so there are people, both locals um, who were not repressed and um, former victims of political repression and their families who continue to visit um, the monuments um, it throughout Comey, um, especially on October 30th, you know, the day of commemoration of the victims of political repression. Um, this is this picture was taken with the flowers laid there. This entire square um, right here um, in front of the MVD building was um, filled with people that um, and, and clergy and local representatives of the regional government um, were there in town celebrating. So it's, it's a very diverse, the crowd is as, as diverse um, as it was in the beginning, but I would say um, that primarily children um, and relatives of the repressed share um, um, attend these monuments and look at these monuments. Thank you, uh, Tyler. Our next question is from Michael Goodman. Has similar investigative research been conducted in Gulag camps and prisoners in the Kalima and elsewhere in the Russian Far East? Yeah, um, I know that there's a, a fantastic book by um, Susanna Bogomil who compared three different regions. Um, Comey's one of them. Um, the Urals region, I think, is another, and uh, the Russian Far East, and she does um, investigate um, the conflicts over memory in the Russian Far East. Um, and, oh, and the Solovetsky Islands. That was that was that was the other region. Um, so there there have been investigations of of the robustness of memory in the Russian Far East, and also the Solovetsky Islands, which is um, uh, as the subject of another fantastic book. Um, about uh, Solovki and artistic production in, in the camps. Just to follow up, then, is there something different in these other investigations as it, as it relates to Comey, or do they, you find that there's a familiar pattern to these? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Comey is, follows the pattern of that. So like that monument I showed, the chapel, um, follows the pattern of the, the church and the by the late 90s and early 2000s was starting to flex its own muscles and, and insert itself into this project. There was a competition held in Siktivkar um, that Siktivkar Memorial held, uh, was part of and Fuan Pakayanya was part of to decide what the monument in the capital of the Komi Republic would look like. And the competition, um, there's no document, I haven't found any documents about it yet, but from oral histories of those who participated in the judging panel that the competition failed because the church did not like the monuments that were proposed by local artists. Um, they were too grim um, and they chose a more mournful approach, which is directly linked to the 1956 monument that passed through um, sort of party censorship because it was a grave marker. And so this, this idea of marking graves is, is sort of innocuous um, and important. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why they were able to do that. But in Comey is also unique in that monuments are still going up there. Um, they still have a robust um, 
civil association dedicated to commemorating victims of political repression. Um, there, these exist also in the Russian regions in the Far East, um, uh, but you know, Comey is, is particularly unique in that they still field letters from former prisoners um, regularly. Uh, another question from Twitter, can you discuss the generational interests and focus on historical memory in the Gulag? Have things like Yuri Dud's uh, documentary on Kolyma uh, increased interest among Russia's younger generation? That's an excellent question. Um, and I would say that, yeah, the, the new um, work coming out from um, Russian documentarians and also the work of the Gulag um, History Museum in Moscow um, have helped get a younger generation interested in this topic. Um, in Comey, younger people are um, continue to be invested in the topic, um, but again, not in a way that maybe their parents were when they were young. Um, but I think that the link between generations comes from um, families who were victim, who were related to people who were repressed, um, continue to pass this generational memory. Um, from generation to generation and continue to engage in this memory project and, and to keep it alive. Um, so I think that documentaries that come out on the internet um, in, in Russia are helping this um, and from time to time they'll spark that same interest. Well, um, you know, my family experienced it this way or, or the same sort of debate over how to commemorate this past in question. Uh, our next question comes from Benson Chung. And he asked, how do indigenous Komi memories of the period of Stalin's repression differ from those of the Gulag prisoners? Have there been any perspectives or involvement by indigenous Komi people in commemorating the Gulag prisoner towns, victims, et cetera? That's a fantastic question. Um, the Komi people had a complex relationship with the sort of the infrastructure of political, the machinery of state repression. Um, they also fell under its wheels uh, and were crushed by Stalinist repression. Um, however, there's not really, and, and this is one of the silences in my own work um, that I need to develop, is that there's not been a lot of work done on the indigenous perspective here. And one of the reasons for that silence in my work is that I simply just don't, I don't, I don't speak or read Comey. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of uh, there are not a lot of sources that also speak to that question um, that I've that I've yet to find. Um, albeit they they do participate in um, Fond Pakayanya and and the, the memorial branches of memorial that existed in Komi. Uh We still have some questions, but we would happy to have some additional ones. Uh, email us uh, to Kenan at WilsonCenter.org. Twitter at Kennan Institute or on our Facebook page. Uh, our next question for, comes from Jake Robertson. And he asked, did the former prison staff, guards and bosses have any involvement in the memory movement? Was there an attempt to punish or expose those people? That's a fantastic question and one which I can um, speak to at length about. Uh, um, so a, a story and then a related, um, a related answer is that there was a former prisoner who was released almost immediately after he was sent to Komi um, to Ucht i Zemlag, which was an oil mining camp. Um, he was the Soviet Union's top geologist, um, arrested, sentenced to the camp. They realized, camp authorities realized who they had had there um, and then released him and hired him on as the camp's top geologist. Um, and he was put in charge. Uh, he was an MVD, a Ministry of Internal Affairs employee, a camp employee, um, and had a lot of authority and power in the camp. Um, and I say this because um, he is both, you could, he could be seen as both a victim and a perpetrator. Um, he held a lot of power in the camps. He did try to help other prisoners um, and other Gulag returnees um, when he could, but there was a museum um, his, when he passed away um, in the 70s, early 70s, uh, his apartment, which was lined with books, was turned into a research library and a museum um, in Uchta. And this was, again, almost a decade or more plus before um, Glasnost and Perestroika. And so we see this sort of veiled monument to victims of political repression, but to this person who was both um, controversially a victim and a, a, 
participant in this system, this uh, state repression. Um, other camp bosses, um, there was a historian by the name of Benjamin uh, Polish Polishnikov, I think his name, family name was, Polishnikov, um, who sort of broke with his KGB um, brothers um, in the late 80s and 90s. And he was, a, he was an archivist and a historian um, and started to write reports and publish on the topic of the history of political repression in Comey. Um, he was you know, threatened and I think he eventually left the KGB, Comey KGB. Um, he grew up in a village which was settled by exiles. Um, and so there were some people who, who worked for the state security services who helped Siktiv Kar Memorial and helped Fon Pakayanya. Um, unfortunately, most of these people have passed away due to old age or um, they just have retired and are no longer in a place to, to help um, Siktiv Kar Memorial or Fon Pakayanya. But there were some former camp guards um, who, who did come forward to Siktiv Karma Memorial to give testimony, but they don't. Um, unfortunately, those records were not, were not kept. Um, Siktiv Karma Memorial existed in a state of semi-legalness in the beginning and their archive moved a lot. And so there were many things that were just lost. Um, but so I, I hope that's not too much detail to your excellent question. Um, okay, our, our next question, um, comes from Amy Ballard. I was in Magadan three years ago. The memorial is in terrible shape. What can be done about it? Are there residents not? Are the residents not interested in maintaining? Uh, I I have uh, an excellent uh, counterexample to that. Um, I can't speak to what the residents of Magadan are um, able to do or interested in doing. But um, as recently as April 20th, um, the Zimtane monument in Komi that I started the presentation with was vandalized. Um, the, there were two swastikas spray painted onto it. Um, and despite a 2008 agreement between um, Latvia and the Russian Federation, no one um, on the Russian side has taken any steps to um, restore the monument, um, citing the difficulty of um, gaining access to it um, in the late as in the late spring when the snow is still knee deep, um, I think that it speaks to a con the conflict that I mentioned in a previous um, question between um, the state's historic patriotic historical memory, which is very well documented, and, and, and the saber rattling that comes with that, and the, and the disregard for victims of political repression that is a, a pro side product of that. But I also think um, in places like Magadan and even in Inta, which is sadly a dying town, just as Vorkota is, it speaks to the demographic and economic crisis that grips the region. Um, and so less than a, a organized campaign against these monuments and against victims of political repression, as horrific and disgusting as the vandalism is, um, I think it speaks loud more toward the economic and demographic crisis that plagued the Russia's regions, especially northern regions where um, work is hard to come by and um, the cities and towns are just simply dying. Uh, another question from Michael Goodman. Uh, did many residents of the Jewish autonomous region end up in the Gulag? Has any type of monument or memorial been built to them? Um, I... Yeah, Birabijan, I can't yeah. speak to um, how many, mon if there is a monument to um, the victims of the Jewish Autonomous Region. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to that. Um, and I can't speak to the numbers of, of among them who were repressed, though I know there were um, victims among them. So I, I can't really answer that question, unfortunately. Uh, picking up on this question of the form of nationalities and former nationalities that used to be in the Soviet Union, the Latvians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, etc. Um, to what extent are they still engaged in this process of memory in the Russian Federation? Or have they just simply decided that now that since they have a, their home country has been restored, uh, that this is just a historical memory and doesn't really engage them in it. Um, 
Comey is another, <laughs> provides us with another um, complex and unique example. Um, the former Volga Germans who were exiled to the region and stayed in the region, um, they were sent to special settlements rather than the camps. Um, they participate in a movement for cultural autonomy within the Comey Republic. Um, what exactly that looks like, I'm uncertain, um, but they have aided Siktif Karma Marial and Fond Paka, now Fond Pakayanya in the search for other victims of political repression um, and, and graves and so on and so forth. Um, there were also, as late as 2012, there was also a sort of like pan-Slavic monument um, erected in Vorkuta uh, by Ukrainian delegation. And there are still you, like a Ukrainian, there is still a Ukrainian contingent in the Komi Republic um, that commemorates the Ukrainians who suffered specifically um, in the camps there. But other than Latvians and Lithuanian, Baltic peoples who are repressed visiting, their children visiting when they can, Polish families visiting when they can, um, the, the number of foreigners, you know, f now foreigners um, coming to Comey to commemorate their dead uh, are, are decreasing as far as I know. And so there, there was the attempt to establish these monuments as, even as late as 2012, but once they're there, they are mostly um, honored and celebrated by local people. Uh, here's a question from Bernie via Facebook. Did these narratives, did the narratives in these exchanges change over time? For example, did they become more invested in redemption, forgiveness? or did the, these tensions hold for a long time after the end of the Soviet Union? Is there any tangible tension among the later generations in Comey now? Um, I think that was the state's worry was that this would lead to ven like revenge and, and vengeance. Um, but as far as the narratives that I, the autobiographical narratives, the memoirs, the autobiographies, the letters, they're not really filled with any kind of um, hatefulness, um, they might um, throw Stalin and the system in general under the bus and speak to particularly cruel and sadistic camp guards, um, but they don't, um, they would almost always emphasize that, you know, the people who are guilty of imprisoning them are already gone and dead, and so they're not looking to seek vengeance, um, they're not looking to exact revenge, um, but they're more so looking for um, reconciliation um, so like truth and reconciliation, this is very much like a, a, a has very much connected to like a post-conflict situation, albeit with a huge, with a delay of, of, of decades. Um, and so even today, I don't, I don't see, there's not like a sense of um, conflict between in people who perpetrated these crimes and, and the survivors, or at least that's not a public conflict. Uh, the next question comes from Marina Cunningham. What about families of prisoners who were executed almost immediately before going to camps? Uh, did they form any type of networks? Um, I can't speak to um, social networks in the, during the Soviet period, but they did join um, Memorial um, and become a part of this greater network of victims, which was ever expanding. And so one of the things I didn't get to talk about was that the press is publishing definitions of victim of political, of Stalinist repression, which became victim of political repression. Um, and so they're constantly expanding the definition of who counts as a, who's a part of this community um, in, in the press. But this, these articles in the local press um, are being fueled by this um, influx of information and letters from former prisoners, exiles, deported nationalities, children of, who were born in the camps, exile, uh, children of exiles who were born in camps, children of parents who were executed and sent to orphanages. And so um, there is solidarity among all of them, um, at least in theory as a community of memory, but uh, Gulag returnees did exert this sort of um, superiority, if you will, uh, it's not really the proper term, but um, superiority among, among themselves as those who had you know, gone to the camps for 10, 15, 20 years and, and, and survived. 
So we've just uh, have, had a delayed celebration of the 75th anniversary of Victory Day with all the celebrations and memorials about that. Um, obviously, the Gulag memory doesn't compete necessarily, mm -hmm. but is it uh, going more into retreat in light of the concentration and all the effort that is poured into celebrating the victory in World War II, the Immortal Regiment, and so forth? Yeah, to, to speak to the regional local example that I'm uh, from the very the most familiar with, um, absolutely, uh, the memory, the celebration of Victory Day in Siktivkar dominates um, if we were to do a side by side comparison. Um, and that is in no small part because, you know, frankly, everybody had someone that participated in, in the war. And that's a part of the sort of the there's a dwindling number of people who are still connected to the memory, the living memory of political repression. Um, and so as, as fewer, as they pass away or move away or their children move away, there's, there are less and less people who come out for October 30th, the day of victims of political repression. Um, albeit there are, due to the demographic crisis that I mentioned to fewer and fewer people at present at the Victory Day Parade. You know, I was shocked um, between 2009, the first time I ever visited Sikh Car, and 2017 with the last time I was there to see the numbers of people who just came out for Victory Day. I mean, 2009, it was, it was like the entire city, um, you know, 250,000 people were out on the street. In 2017, there were much, much less. So here's our last question uh, from Twitter. In light of current events in the United States, have you reflected on ways the US and Russia compare and contrast in handling historical memory? If so, are there lessons to be learned from one another? Um, I think there are many, many lessons to be learned. Um, I think that uh, Ukraine provides us with the, with the fall of the Lenin statues, an interesting example of, of um, sort of decolonization of historical memory um, and the sort of decolonization of the landscape and tearing down um, Lenin statues and, and currently in the United States tearing down um, Confederate statues, which were erected um, long after the Civil War, provide interesting examples. I mean, it would be interesting to see, uh, it would be interesting to see to compare both the Gulag History Museum or, or state museums um, with our sort of museums that in, include darker chapters of the United States um, past, but that's work that hasn't been done yet, not by me, um, at least. Um, and so there are, there, I think there are many lessons to be learned in, in terms of understanding the context in which um, statues um, and historical memories are formed. Um, and also thinking about the dialogue um, that uh, informs these narratives. Well, thank you so much, Tyler, for just a fascinating talk. Uh, we look forward to the book. Uh, and I also wanna again thank Title VIII and the State Department. It's through their generous, generosity and continued support that we have been able to make such an important contribution such as Tyler to understanding this important region. So thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Title VIII. And thank you for listening. Yes, thank you, everyone. And, and thank you, Will.